this workshop so this is as you know this is a basic photography workshop and uh, i'm the presenter sumit dhopar we are going to just learn about the camera settings and you will see that how we can improve our skills with this knowledge what we are going to gain in this workshop So just a bit of introduction myself. Uh, my name is Sumit Dupar. I'm a professional photographer and I consider myself as a digital artist because uh, I like to uh, give it artistic touch in my all the frames. So whatever the kind of photography I'm doing, I like to put some fine art touch in that. I have already already in my gallery it's over 3000 creations. You can check my portfolio in the social media. And since March 2017, I've started all this. and i'm doing this uh, continuously so in during the covid i took a break and now i'm just trying to just get up and try to be more regular as possible in my in this genre so what kind of photography i'm doing so i like to do still life photography in nature product and recently i've developed my still for portraits and i like to spend time in minimal art portraits so minimal art and macro work so and street life because these are the genres which helps me to develop my skills in a uh, 360 degree so i'm trying to just uh, do some test photography based on these uh, skills macro photography help me to be improve my concentration level minimal art work uh, helping me to improve my composition skills because i need to just work with the minimal elements in my photography street life photography i would like to do to capture expressions because i like to do lifestyle photography and that helped me to develop my skills in that and as i said i like to give a canvas or touch uh, feel in my old photography work and i'm offering all my photography services through my website sumitpurawal.com and you must have visit my website and you must have seen that what kind of uh, work i'm doing there um, all the completed workshop gallery available you can check my testimonials and the galleries what i what what kind of work i've done in the past and spw expedition is one of the venture when i'm doing all this uh, learning part and photography trainings and i have different ventures for spw photogram fine art expedition and sumit for the wall is my youtube channel uh you can just go there in the youtube channel you will find some tutorials you will find some behind the scenes and you can give me a comment and i can work on that new content uh, which will help you uh on the social media my profile handle is sumit for the world so anywhere you will find sumit for the world you will find me So as I said, YouTube channel. I'm just running YouTube channel Sumit for the world right now. My this uh, workshop also is going live on my YouTube channel. And on this channel, I have my three play playlist: SPW Launch, where I'm going to present a kind of tutorial related to post processing, kind of Photoshop and Lightroom. I'm doing, I'm using most of the time. So I like to do some training part on that. So I've given uh, some videos already there. Uh, where i'm covering some basic parts for lightroom and photoshop and spw expedition whatever the workshop i'm doing outdoor uh, i'm i'm publishing there in that playlist so just for inspiration you can see that or my previous work there as spw bts it's a behind the scenes so whatever the work i'm going to do right now i decided so whatever new project i'm going to do i'll create one behind the scene video so i can show that how i developed all those photos behind the scenes you can subscribe my channel and you can share your feedback suggestions so i can make new content for that so this is scheduled for today's workshop so we'll have two sessions both will be 60 minutes and we'll take 10 minutes break we'll have some extra time for q and a session if required if you feel Uh, you can uh, just note down the questions, and we can bring, we can go in detail for the discussion in the Q and A sessions. But you are allowed to raise your hand, and you can ask questions in between during the uh, workshop. So it's not restricted. So whenever you feel you want to talk, you can talk. So I like to be interactive sessions because it's a one-way talking. Maybe you will not. Get some points, so you can stop me and you can ask for the clarification. We can go for small discussion on that. Video, you can start if you want, but I do not recommend because it will help to improve the performance of this video session. 
and you can keep your questions in the chat box uh, or in, in the notepad you can note down the questions that you want to ask uh, for the QA session so without wasting much time because we are already delayed 15 minutes uh, we are starting delayed uh, this uh, we usually start our workshop around time only because it's a time restricted and we do not want to waste much of it so let's start how DSLR camera works. So this is our first topic. So whenever we want to learn photography, uh, before starting this, I want to ask you what camera you have. Okay, you want to stay muted. Okay, you can type in in the chat box. No problem with that. So what what camera you have? I just want to uh, know that. So what understanding you will have, you will get out of this. Okay, you have Fujifilm A7. Okay, great. Uh, so hopefully and this will help you to understand the components, how DSLR works. So if you can see the diagram here, we have uh, two diagrams. One is where the DSLR diagram at the normal state when we are not doing shooting and the other is the uh, moment of the time when the DSLR is capturing image. So oh, how it is different. So you can see the uh, components here. You can see the lenses inside the body, uh, inside the lens. Uh, you can see the group of lens elements here. So these are lenses. And how the light travel inside, pass through the lenses. And you can see the light, when once it's coming to the uh, DSLR sensor, it's coming horizontally. But we have viewfinder, so how it will reach there. So we have reflex mirror here. Reflex mirror, what it do? When we press shutter release button, it'll just let that uh, uh, reflex mirror go up and capture the image but before that what it will do it will let that light pass through the reflex mirror and reach the penta prism so it will make that horizontal light vertical and reach the penta prism and the penta prism what is doing it is just making that vertical light horizontal so we can uh, see through the viewfinder so it's uh, letting the uh, light pass through the viewfinder and that's how we see the frame uh, when we are looking through the viewfinder but at the time of uh, shooting the reflex mirror goes up and it'll let the light directly reach the sensor you can see the strip line at the end and that's how the image getting recorded when we press the shutter release button and these are the components we have lens we have reflex mirror as i said this is the reflex, reflex mirror it is always stays at the 45 degree angle but at the time of shooting it'll just it'll right uh, go up and let the light reach the sensor matte focusing screen this is matte focusing screen at the top penta prism and this is the you can see we can easily identify this is the penta prism and eyepiece this is the viewfinder and focal plane shutter. So this is the focal plane shutter you can see here. So when we say shutter release button, uh, it means it's a button which is opening the shutter. So that's why we have name like that. And sensor, we have sensor at the end. This is strip line you can see at the end, red line. So this is the sensor where the image getting recorded. And this is what, what, what uh, I have explained on this. Uh, you can just go through the recording of this session and you can read three or read through all but this is what explained uh, in the content here now we'll just understand how mirrorless camera works because nowadays everyone is talking about mirrorless camera so it's better to have some kind of in knowledge inside what is the body and how it is different uh, different from the DSLR so you can see the components here so there are a lot of components in the dslr body you can see uh, but in compared to mirrorless camera it's uh, it's having too much but in mirrorless camera you can see the a lot of components taken out and we have this lens we have shutter plane there this shutter plane and the sensor and there is one new member here in the components we have electronic viewfinder so this is the kind of a uh, interesting uh, component in the mirrorless camera. People talk about uh, mirrorless camera because it has electronic viewfinder. So it means it's uh, recording the images live. So anything which we see through the viewfinder, it is going to record as it is. There will be no change 
and even the exposure contrast colors everything will be the same as it is looking through the lcd on the mirrorless camera and it's more simple than the dslr and here the sensor is, sensor is directly exposed to the light so you can see sensor is directly exposed there is no mechanism for pent up prism directly light reaches and we see through the live preview of the image because it is connected through the viewfinder live view, electronic viewfinder it generates a live preview of the scene directly into the electronic viewfinder and that's the mechanism it's the same component and when we press shutter release button again it will just open the shutter and let the image uh, let the light reach the sensor and record the image and it's the same uh, process what is what it has been in the dslr benefits of mirrorless camera so now we'll just understand some benefits of mirrorless camera Mirrorless camera, as I said, there are very less components compared to DSLR, so it's a very compact body. Very small, small sensor means small camera, making the mirrorless camera is easier to carry. So it's a quite look like a, a point and shoot camera, and it's very lightweight. We can easily carry it yeah. for the longer time for handheld photography. Electronic viewfinder, so final image preview appears directly on the image sensor, offering live view. Uh, which then displays on the rear LCD. This image preview allows you to adjust settings like exposure, brightness, saturation, contrast, and uh, before taking your shot. So as I said, everything what you see through the LCD or on the uh, mirrorless camera, it is going to record it, it is, as it is. So uh, you can adjust the exposure, brightness, saturation, contrast before taking your shot. Image stabilization. So because it's a lightweight body, it's very easy to handle for a long time and you will have more stability and it will be less prone for shaking, shaking your hands. So if we hold the camera for a longer time, there's a possibility we'll shake the camera and it'll introduce some blurness in the image. But uh, in image, with the image stabilization and lightweight body, it's really helping to get uh, along with the long run. We can carry it for a long time uh, with for handheld photography while camera while taking pictures without using tripod we can easily use it uh, for a longer time silent mechanism because it's having very fewer parts so there are very fewer parts moving inside their body and you will see that it's a very very quiet body so there will be very less noise compared to dslr Higher shooting speed with better focusing capabilities for contrast, contrast detection and high shutter speed. Mirrorless cam models makes it easier for photographers to capture it faster. So this is one of the advantage or the we can say the catching point in the mirrorless camera. It's having very high shutters, uh, high shooting speed. If you have heard about burst mode on the camera, in uh, general DSLR we have burst mode where we capture image in Nikon it's having a setting like it will take 10 images if you keep press the shutter release button if you keep hold it it will take uh, 10 images uh, in the burst and you will see in the 10 images somewhere around six images will be coming in sharp but high but in the mirrorless camera that rate improved so in the mirrorless camera it's a average your response is somewhere around eight to nine images you will have that much of the quality on the mirrorless camera if you use burst mode in the mirrorless camera it will give you around eight or nine images with the sharp quality so you can see the little just brief on the components light shutter unit and the image sensor So what's the difference? So we will just try to understand some differences uh, between the DSLR and the mirrorless camera. Mirrorless cameras are more lightweight. So this is the plus point for them. And mirrorless camera offers real-time previews of exposure and contrast. So as I said, it's offering a real-time preview, live preview of your images. Uh, whatever you are going to capture, you can see what is, how it will look like on the final capture. So that's again a plus point. Mirrorless cameras have shorter battery life due to EVF, electronic viewfinder. It's because of it's taking a lot of power. So if you're carrying mirrorless camera, you must carry one backup battery with you. Otherwise it is very difficult to survive one full day 
with single battery because electronic viewfinder is going to drain your uh, battery very soon compared to DSLR. In DSLR, mm, some latest devices you can carry one battery and you can easily continue with the whole day with one battery. I have my Nikon D750 and very rarely I need to take out my second backup battery out. So that's an advantage with the DSLR. Mirrorless camera are costly and budget DSLR will offer the entry level photographer more value than a budget mirrorless camera. So if you're going to plan your buying on the DSLR, upgrading your camera device, then for, for a learner, for someone who is going to start their photography journey, it's better to go for the DSLR on the budget instead of going for the budget mirrorless camera because the budget DSLR will give, give you a lot of features, a lot of advanced um, options there in the device which is not available in the budget mirrorless camera compared to their cost. So that's again an advantage with the DSLR. Mirrorless cameras offer fewer accessories. They are still lacking in their selection of attachment and lens mount. So they are still developing. Compared to DSLR, we'll still have a lot of uh, uh, third party companies who are offering accessories for the DSLR more compared to the mirrorless. Mirrorless cameras shoot faster rate. Uh, particularly when it comes to continuous shooting or a burst of images. So burst mode, as I said, it's an advantage with the mirrorless because they are lightweight body and uh, because of the less components also they have, uh, they will give you better uh, results in the burst mode compared to DSLR. So that's an advantage with the mirrorless camera. Mirrorless cameras offer more image stabilization. So lack of a mirror mechanism means mirrorless camera offer more image stabilization and less shaky photos. So there is no reflex mirror there and there is no pent up light reaching directly to the sensor. And that's why it's a very improved image stabilization we have in the mirrorless camera. Mirrorless cameras have smaller sensor size uh, compared to DSLR. So this is something uh, we can say the strong point we have in the DSLR and that's why they are still leading the market. And when we have small sensor in the device, it means it's not good or ideal for low light situations. When we have low light situation, uh, we'll have DSLR with a bigger sensor and it'll help us to get more uh, light out of the uh, gloomy situation if in the evening late hours you are trying to take a picture or in early hours in the morning then dslr will be having better opportunity of give you better uh, results compared to mirrorless mirrorless cameras have less accurate autofocus system. So this is a very critical point. Autofocus system of mirrorless camera uses contrast detection rather than phase detection. It cannot measure the distance between the lens and the subject as accurately as a DSLR can. So this is something DSLR have in their, uh, we can say the system, which is the, uh, we can say the backbone of the DSLR that phase detection it's accurately calculating the distance between the camera and the subject. So between the lens and the subject. And that's why I prefer to advise for the go for the DSLR, someone who is really new to the photography. And for the back, for the other second device, we can always go for the mirrorless camera. But I prefer to have first a DSLR before going to the mirrorless camera. And that's why they are leading the market. Now we'll just go through the camera modes. In all the DSLR cameras, we have some uh, camera modes, P, S, A, and M modes. These are called exposure modes because these are the modes which are going to help us to manage the exposure in our images. Shooting modes are fall into three categories, auto, scene, and PSA, and M modes. PSA and M modes, we have separate category because these are semi modes. In auto and scene modes, uh, the camera controls shutter speed and aperture. It means if you are in auto and scene modes, camera going to control everything in your device. So 
you will get exposure accurately every time but you will see some uh, uh, it's giving quite a flat images of it means it's not having the we can say the real feel of the dslr i've seen images captured from the dslr they look like they're captured from the mobile phone so that's what uh, happen if we do if we are not utilizing the device uh, with their potential we'll see the quality is not matching and PSA and M modes are also known as exposure modes because they are going to manage the exposure and give photographers a choice to which elements of the exposure aperture or shutter speed so these are the key elements of exposure they wish to control so in the semi modes we have control on one of those uh, express aspect either we can control the aperture or shutter speed so in the nikon device i have a uh, dial button from nikon and canon in the nikon you can see it's a very simple notified m a s p m is for manual a is aperture s for shutter priority and p is a programmable mode in canon also we have similar but instead of a for aperture it's having av and for shutter priority it's having tv Go and rest to are same M for manual and P for programmable, programmable mode. This is we call programmable flexible mode, and we will understand in the coming slides so why we call like this. And in this info screen, this is the info screen from Nikon device. That's how the details look like in the info screen. We can see the uh, shutter speed and what aperture we have set, and this is the light meter. This is very critical point. If you are in the manual mode, we can utilize the light meter to uh, to just calculate that how the light will uh, look like in the final capture. It will going to be underexposed, overexposed, or the balanced exposure. We try to keep it around in the middle. If it is going more in the negative side, it is going to underexpose. If it is going on the more positive side, then it will going to overexpose the image. And you can see the ISO, we can see, and the number of images, battery powers, all these things we can see in, on the info screen. You have to turn off the LCD on the device and press the info button on the camera and you will get this screen. Now we'll just go a little detail on these camera modes. Mode P, program mode. So this camera mode automatically, the camera automatically adjusts the aperture and shutter speed for optimal exposure. So if you are in program mode and if you change the, to the program mode and just move your uh, lens to in different, different lighting conditions and you will see that the combination of uh, shutter priority and aperture will keep changed. That's what happened in the program mode. Program photographer can choose from different combination of aperture and shutter speed that will produce the same exposure. That's why this is known as a flexible program because you can use this mode in any light situation, any time of the day. You can use this mode P, and you will see the exposure or every time coming good. So you will never see that there is an underexposure or overexposed image. And you have to take correct focus on the subject. And that's uh, really the key point. And mode S, shutter priority. Uh, it's a shutter priority. Well, when we say shutter priority, it means our priority is to control the shutter speed. So we are going to control the shutter speed and camera are going to adjust the aperture for us for optimal exposure. Mode A and it's just opposite of that mode S and then camera going to uh, control the shutter speed here. We are going to control the aperture. So that's what with the mode S and mode P. And mode M, as it says, manual, and uh, you are going to control everything, uh, every aspects on the device. Shutter speed, aperture, you are going to control. You can manually adjust both the combinations, what suits your photography. And you can utilize that for more creative results. Providing greater, uh, providing the greatest latitude for creative expression. So when we say like this, it means we are sometimes we are going to uh, make our image uh, with purpose underexposed and overexposed. That's where the creativity comes. Choosing the wrong for, uh, wrong combination could, however, results photographers that are overexposed or underexposed. So if we are doing with purpose, that will that we call as a creativity. If we are doing without purpose, we want good exposure in our image, but it happens to give us 
underexposed or overexposed, then we say it's error. So it can be error, it can be creative results. Uh, it's up to you what you are trying to achieve. We therefore recommend using a camera exposure indicator as your guide when choosing the aperture and shutter speed. So when you are in manual mode, keep an eye on the light meter and see that how the light meter is behaves. And you can adjust these settings, these combinations of shutter speed and aperture to get your desired result. In all the three modes, P, S and A, exposure is automatically adjusted for optimal results. So P, S, A, A P, S and A modes, uh, your good friend. So whenever you feel that uh, you're not comfortable with the M mode, so you can work with these, th these three modes and you will get good exposure all the time. Now we'll just understand exposure balance, EV. So exposure compensation, we call it, and we can see the button on the device with the plus minus signs, some square boss you, you can see on the Canon and the similar we have on the Nikon. On the Fuji device, uh, I see the dial button here. So this that's how the manufacturers uh, have their own, uh, we can say the differences and significance, uh, how they can show their device and controlling the same settings, but having kind of different, uh, uh, of, you can say the notification or the symbols on the device. How to make your photos lighter and darker. So you can see the image here, minus three to, min to plus three, plus three will be brighter, minus three will be darker. So it's a kind of similar, uh, quite similar to the light meter what we have seen. So here we are going to tell camera that this is not the underexposed, this is not the overexposed. So we are going to uh, control that power on the on ourselves. And the trick is this mode, this uh, exposure compensation button or the feature works when we are in the semi modes. In the manual modes, we are going to control all the exposure. So how to make your photos and lighter and darker, we can use this exposure compensation and it'll, it'll, you can create that results. Camera light meter is not error free. So sometimes you will see the camera light meter is also not giving the results. So we have to adjust the exposure compensation. We can work with the semi modes and we can utilize that. Exposure compensation definition can be described as a way to override the camera metering. So we can meter, we can override the camera metering setting. So we have a um, dedicated part here uh, in the end where we'll just study the camera metering modes and this exposure composition can help us to overcome that. This works well in optimal light conditions and weather. So when you have good light condition, it will give you good results uh, because in uh, low light condition or the light condition when not suitable, uh, for the photography, you will see it's not helping. Exposure composition is only available in auto and semi modes. So as I said, it is only available in semi modes. So you can utilize this feature there. These are just example images, uh, just to uh, give you brief on that, how exposure compensation behaves. You can see the image with the white background. Now uh, we have a vase, flower vase in a white background at the zero balance. It means nothing overexposed, nothing underexposed. You can see that it's not looking pure white, but to make pure white, we have to make it plus two exposure. We have to adjust our exposure compensation to plus two. And if we go to minus two, you can see it's showing completely dark image there. So that's what it is. Uh, if you are going to minus values, it is going to make images dark, but we can utilize this when uh, we are in a bright condition. So if we are having two bright lights, we can use uh, these minus values to make it a little darker. If we are in a dark conditions where the light is not good, we can add exposure. We can increase that, uh, we can say exposure uh, compensation, we can compensate what is the camera calculating exposure, we can compensate it by adding more values there and it will make it look better exposed. In portrait photography, even in studio, we can utilize this. If you see these photos with minus three, we have little darker in the background, 
compared to minus t exposure compensation minus 2 so that's how we utilize even in the studio lights to make a good uh, separation between the subject and the background we can use this exposure compensation now we'll just understand um, some detailed about shutter speed because we are going to cover all the aspects of the exposure as a definition shutter speed is the length of time that the camera shutter remain open and allow the light to reach the camera sensor some people call this as exposure time and that's that's what uh, how we can uh, signify or how we can um, identify or calculate all these terms exposure time shutter release time shutter speed all quite similar so to freeze a fast moving object uh, we have a shutter speed of 1 by 4000 to 1 by 1000 these are fraction of seconds so that's too fast even the nowadays we have devices where it supports 1 by 8000 of shutter speeds so that's how uh, uh, we can the faster speed we can get and uh, if, if if you have uh, if you are capturing hummingbird we say 1 by 4000 is also not good enough to freeze the bird freeze the bird feathers it's so fast and 1 by 250 and 1 to 1 by 160 these are good for journal photos where we do not have we can say so much movement or there are very slow movement uh, we can move between 1 by 60 to 1 by 250 and we have slow shutter speed or long exposures with the 1 by 2 to 1 by 30 so these are the range for shutter speed where we consider these as a long exposure to blur the motions we can create motion blurs in consistent movement so when there is a consistent movement so like we are capturing a waterfall it's consistently moving at the same uh, falling at the same speed so there we can adjust our shutter speed to create motions in that flow we have very high, uh, very long exposure also uh, like the two second to ten second you can see this value when you see a single digit on the device it's uh, it notifies that we are in the seconds not in fraction of seconds when we are seeing one by something digit it is a fraction of second otherwise if you see single digit it's a uh, seconds two second to ten seconds consider this a uh, long exposure to paint with the light so if you are doing light painting uh, uh, photography then we go for that much of uh, long shutter speeds uh, we can capture stars fireworks and to make river water as a glass so if you are uh, on the river side you can use the long shutter speed uh, if uh, it's very dark or at you can see the evening time where the light is not good you can utilize this long shutter speed without using any nd filter that's a natural density filters which helps us to block the light reaching the sensor to get more shutter speed to get long shutter speed i should say so to create those uh, long shutters uh, long exposures in the good light condition we can use those nd, ND filters this is the ex example image uh, we can see the faster speed making that subject look freeze but with the slow shutter speeds we are seeing everything around the subject is still but the subject still itself moving so it's creating a motion there with the slow shutter speed shutter speed uh, we can see the values here the dial button as we have seen this is how we select the shutter shutter priority mode and uh, we can go for a shutter speed as low as 30 seconds and as high as 1 by 4000 but latest devices they have uh, we have some uh, pro pro devices where they are supporting 1 by 8000 of shutter speed and when we change one shutter speed to another uh, it could be lower or higher we'll call that as one step so we are moving one step forward or backward so decreasing or increasing shutter speed by one step handheld shutter speed so for handheld shutter speed there is a thumb rule uh, where we have handheld shutter speed means uh, whatever the focal length of the lens we are using we have to have shutter speed reciprocal of uh, that focal length if like uh, i always give an example of 50 mm lens on the camera we don't have one by 50 shutter speed 
so how you will how you will manage it so when we don't have it means we have to go one step higher so we'll have one by 60 of shutter speed that's how we calculate the handheld shutter speed and if you have vr function or image stabilization on your device on your lens keep that on when you are not on tripod but when you are on the tripod turn that off otherwise you will see the blurry or shaky images are coming even if you are in good shutter speed so this is a keynote you should keep remember it these are dslr handheld techniques so this that's how we uh, hold the dslr device we have the knee band the elbow plant so we are just planting our elbow on the hard surface and the T-Rex, what it says, it's the very orthodox uh, combination or the form of holding the DSLR, where we keep our elbow we're near to the body and make our palm like a stable uh, platform to place over device. That's how we make a stabilization of more, in, uh, we can say without the tripod, we can have good handheld uh, photograph without tripod. If we are giving more stability to the device. And the toad strap is like that. We are just stretching that with the strap, and it's helping to give more stability because there is not so much movement. Now we'll just talk about aperture. The definition for aperture: the aperture controls f-stop. We always, uh, when we talk about uh, aperture, it's f-stop controls the amount of light reaching the sensor through the lens. So we, sometimes we call this as eye for the lens. I, uh, eye for the device, the camera. So lens is having uh, like the eye and the aperture is eye uh, for the inside the lens where we can keep it full open or we can just change, we can control that uh, hole of that, uh, how the light will travel to the lens. Uh, we'll just see with the examples, you will understand better. The aperture size will regulate the depth of field. So the shallow, the, uh, we can say the small f number you have the shallow depth of field you will see the very limited depth of field everything behind or in front will be blurred if we have large f number uh, everything will be in focus so most of the things i should say so we'll just understand these values 1.4 create bokeh effect and good for low light photographies because uh, it's an eye for the lens uh, the, the camera and it's, if you are at the low f, uh, small f number, it allows more light to reach the sensor. And it will help to create that bokeh effect because it's a very shallow depth of field. Very limited depth of field we'll get uh, in that f1.4. In 2.8, f2.8 to f5.6, we consider these good for portrait photography and sports photography because it's uh, most of the time giving you good depth of field to capture the person or the sports person or the, your subject um, from, from front to back. So I should say that you will capture that complete subject in good focus. And uh, there is one good example, human body or the, we can say the structure of our face is like that. Uh, it's covered between six inches. So. At 5.6, most of the time you will have that kind of depth of field you will get. You have to focus on the eye. So every time we are taking a focus, we always take focus from the eye. And uh, it will make sure that some part of the nose and the ears will be in focus. So that considered as good portrait photography. F8 to F16, good for landscape uh, to get increased depth of field. So when we are going to F8 or above, it means we are uh, let me just change the camera battery.
minutes. Sorry for the interruption. Let's check the temperature now. Okay, we were talking about F8 to F16. So it's considered as a good for a landscape uh, photography because it increases the depth of field. But what what actually behind the scene or the technical reason is that it's help it helps you to get the infinity on the coverage. So most of the lens around F11 and they will give you the infinity coverage. It means anything behind in the far kilometers away from the subject they'll also come in good focus at least in the focus you can identify if a building is there at the far kilometers behind uh, you will you can easily see you can easily identify that that is a building it will not blur out uh, like in the bokeh uh, in the shallow depth of field and that's how we Consider that F8 to F16 is good for landscape for landscape photography because anything behind in the landscape you can identify what is that. F16 to F32 good for long exposure and create star burst uh, burst effect with small focal length. So if you have small focal length somewhere around 50 mm and you can take a, you can have your aperture F16 and somewhere around. A, long exposure like of 2 second 10 second you can you can check different different values for long exposure and you will see that light effect is key, uh, keep improving on the star effect the more long exposure it will give you better uh, you can see the star burst effect on the light you can create that even with the sun uh, sometimes we call it as sunny 16 rule you can search on that the youtube that sunny 16 it's a really good trick to create a starburst effect on the sun. Depth of field. Uh, the distance in front of and behind the focus point that appears to be in focus is referred to as depth of field. This is the definition that how we can define what is depth of field. So anything, um, any distance in front of you and the behind, that is called as depth of field. And you can see these uh, images below. Large F number is small aperture. People always get confused. So that's why I make this slide very clear. So we'll understand small F number is a large aperture. And what it means large aperture. Large, uh, large aperture means the uh, camera eye is completely open. And it decreases the depth. It decreases the depth of field. Small F number, large aperture. You can see the focus is in the middle of the box and the box behind and in front they are out of focus but in small aperture when we have large f number small is really uh, hole is really small but at the cost of it's increased the depth of field so anything in front behind all are in good focus so that's what we have the effect of uh, our f number but it'll stop the light. The hole is really small, it'll stop the light. So if light condition is not good, then we could not go for this. We have to have some kind of large aperture there to allow more light at the cost of depth of field. And it'll help us to create some good results also because nowadays we considered bokeh images are looking more attractive, more cinematic compared to that. Everything showing is in the, in the focus. So this, that's how the dial button looks like on the Nikon device. This is the Nikon device dial button. And the F numbers, as low as we can have F1.4, depends on your lens. Some lens will have their low, as low as 4.5 if you have Nikon 70 to 300 mm lens. F4.5 uh, is available on the 70 mm. And if you go to 300 mm, you will see it's not letting you go below uh, 5.6. 5.6 so is the limit for that. We can have as low as 1.4 uh, depends on the lens. Very large aperture. F2.8 is something we call it as a large aperture and medium aperture is ranges somewhere between 5.6 to F8. If you are in F11 then we'll call it as a small aperture where it starts to getting smaller f22 is really very small aperture and this is the uh, these are this is the, the symbols to make you better understand small depth of field 
we are going to lower the f number it will just make the depth of field smaller and but lighter also you will get to good light and for if you are going on the right side uh, to increasing the f number the depth of field uh, will increase large depth of field you will get but it will make the image look darker compared to the small uh, f number now we'll just talk about iso sensitivity definition so by definition iso sensitivity is a measure of the camera's ability to capture light so it's a camera ability to sense light that's what we call it as a iso digital camera converts the light that falls on the image sensor into electronical signals uh, for processing so it will convert that image uh, it will just uh, convert the light into electrical signals for processing it will allow the camera to process the light in form of electrical signals iso sensitivity raised uh, by amplifying the signal so what it will do it will do it will just amplify those signals that's why it sends more light and if you are in a dark uh, light condition when the light condition is not supporting and you raise the iso you will see a lot of noise showing in the image a uh, kind of grainy effect you will see and that's because it's amplifying a lot of signals and it's introducing all that artifacts in other words in, if iso sensitivity is raised from 100 to 200 while aperture is left unchanged the same exposure can be achieved with a, a shutter speed twice as fast so if you are raising shutter speed it means you are helping your device to get, get to capture same exposure at more higher shutter speed so if you are in a low light condition where shutter speed is going really low below the handheld you can raise the iso and you will get somewhere around handheld shutter speed to compensate and if you raise iso sensitivity you can choose faster shutter speed as i said and it reduces the camera blur definitely if you are in a good handheld shutter speed you will uh, have a better possibility to get capture good images and it will reduce the camera blur this is why people say that iso sensitivity should be raised if your uh, lighting is poor so if you have a uh, really poor lighting condition when light condition is not supportive then only go for raising the iso no flash low light photograph when lighting is poor you can use the flash to light portrait subjects so we can use flashlight to portrait subjects when light is not good flash units however have limited range so if you talk about general entry level or some basic flash you know, available in the market uh, they have very limited range if you raise a uh, iso sensitivity you can optimally expose both the portrait subject and the background without using a flash at all if you see the images below the image on the left side taken with the flash you can see the subject is in good exposure the light is good but the ambient light nothing is captured behind so you can see it's completely dark behind but uh, the image taken on the right is uh, with the iso high iso sensitivity without flash and you can see it's all ambient light nothing flash all ambient light and you can see the background so ambient light also captured well because it has high iso that's the difference between using the flash photography and the photography in the natural light even using the iso noise at high iso raising iso sensitivity allows faster shutter speeds reducing blurs caused by the subject or the camera movement but in fact raising the iso sensitivity can introduce a type of image artifact known as noise so when you must have heard many people talk about noise in the images so this is nothing but the artifacts or the grainy effect what we see in the image uh, which brings into your photographs because of high iso raising iso sensitivity amplifies the electrical signals uh, which also amplifies any noise in the signal so it is going to amplify all the electronic signals uh, and uh, that's why it brings a lot of noise as a result the higher the iso sensitivity the more obvious the effect of noise on your photographs the more you increase the iso the more grainy effect you will see on that image the same is true of all the digital cameras 
we recommend that you raise iso sensitivity only as high as needed to avoid blood so again it's repeated 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 that you only raise iso when it is needed it's not a fun to raise iso when it is not required so i've seen images because i'm uh, running a uh, photographic group on the facebook and i've seen images where people in a good light condition also having some high iso so i i, I never imagine that what could be the reason behind it maybe they were having auto iso uh, turned on on their device that could that could be the only possible reason what i, I could suspect but we are fear in good light condition avoid high iso you will get good clean images at the low iso iso sensitivity can be set manually by the photographer or automatically by the camera so as i said you can have auto iso turned on the device or you can control it manually okay so we are just on the uh, simulator app and you can see this uh, when we open this page we are having a quite a camera looking uh, device kind of all the functions you can see the modes the manual mode shutter priority aperture priority we'll just see that how these uh, modes work in real time likewise if you are in the shutter priority mode you will see you can only control the shutter speed and you can just uh, keep an eye on this aperture how it's moving when we are changing shutter speed it's uh, adjusting the aperture priority but there is one point so at this point if i'm going to lower it when i'm going to increase the shutter speed it is going to adjust the iso because it's an auto iso it's going to adjust the iso to make that image look uh, in good exposure that's how it works and in the motion you can see if we are at the long exposure one second it's completely motion and if we are going high shutter speed it is going on the freeze that's how in real time also it works let's take a photo or with the long exposure with one second it's showing that it's good exposure just on the one slightly over but it's good exposure you can see that and what was the setting shutter speed one by one and aperture is f22 iso 200 remember that uh, at this shutter speed anything that moves that fast will be close to invisible you can see that uh, fan wings it's invisible to capture the movement increase shutter speed so now we are going to increase the shutter speed we are going to just make it 1 by 4000 and uh, iso increase to 6400 and just capture it you can see the aperture f2.8 you can see uh, something in the foreground and the background it's blurred that's the effect of 2.8 shutter speed 1 by 1000 4000 aperture 2.8 iso 6400 now we'll just go to aperture and it's just opposite of that if we are going to change aperture it is going to adjust the shutter speed because we are an aperture priority let's take that one photo with f2.8 and the shutter speed is 1 by 8 iso 400 you can see the similar effect we have the it's a we can see some, we can feel that something is moving something is uh, something was there as if wings and plates and if we are going to f22 shutter speed will be very low one by three seconds because it we are on the aperture priority and camera has to manage the exposure so what it's going to do it is going to lower the shutter speed to uh, to let more light come into the sensor it's quite similar but you can see everything is in good focus foreground background is in good focus 
but we are in manual mode if we are in manual mode uh, we can control anything there. so we can just select over customize setting aperture will be f8 we'll see the shutter speed 1 by 30 second it's giving us a good exposure we'll just make it little underexposed just little little underscore on the two minus two we can see that very underscore but to compensate to get more light what we can do we can increase the iso 1600 so this is what we have in our customized setting we have f8 and uh, iso is 1600 shutter speed one by two no, one by 125 so that's how we can play with the manual so when we are uh, practicing the manual mode that's how we can get more creative results more desired results uh, in the camera when we are in the dslr any questions so far No, the exposure will be same. Yeah. So there is a, uh, when we the question is that if the exposure will be different in the mirrorless camera. No, exposure will be same. What mirrorless camera help us uh, is as we have seen as we have studied about the mirrorless camera. It's having lighter body. It's having small sensor. It's having its own benefit of electronic viewfinder. Everything is there but the basic components remain same the exposure uh, we can say the concept remains same so for uh, we have aperture priority we have shutter priority we have iso there so all the components are there what we have in the dslr just all are there in the mirrorless camera so you will not see the difference in terms of exposure so if image capture in the same uh, with the same settings uh, in the DSLR, in the mirrorless camera, very, very rarely you will see that you will notice anything, any, anything difference. It's only the photographer knows that how easy or difficult it was to capture the same image, but the quality uh, will more or less will be same in both the devices. I hope I have answered it. Let's move forward now. We have completed that simulator. Now we'll just talk about the focusing modes. So it's very critical. If we have good understanding of focusing modes, then we are in a better position to capture different uh, activities, the actions uh, when, we are, when we are using the SLR. When I, when I say like this, it means we are either could be on the one shot, single focal, single focus uh, focusing system, or we are on the uh, AFC, that's continuous focusing mode. So we'll just learn all these focusing modes here. So when we talk about one shot focusing modes, so in Canon, we call it as a one shot, and Nikon, we have uh, this uh, call as AFS. Now we can see the single focus which represents a single focus capability so if you are pressing shutter release button halfway it'll just say take the focusing calculation once so it'll if you change the uh, we can say the distance between the subject and the camera or subject uh, make a movement it will not refocus even if you have your focal point right on the subject it will not refocus it will not recalculate the focus so that's the limitation of a one focusing mode 
but it will save a lot of battery power in this mode when you depress that uh, shutter release halfway the camera focuses on the subject just once there is no continuous adjustment this mode saves battery power and ideal for subject that aren't moving so we are, we are doing still life photography or the subject not making movement like the portrait we can ask someone to stay there for that much of the seconds and uh, that's in, that should be enough to capture the image even with the one focusing mode one shot focusing mode and on the camera uh, when we see through the viewfinder we'll see the focal points like this and one of the focal point will be active and they, that's what would be would be used to take a focus calculation so uh, try to have your center focal point always there keep your your focal point right in the center because that considered to be the strongest focal uh, we can say the sensor for detecting focus if we are having some selected uh, uh, our focal point on the left right up down then you may have a uh, images where the focus no, was not accurate so so for a most accurate focus uh, detection always try to have your focal point right in the middle and on the can on the nikon device we'll have uh, uh, settings in the device we can select that which focusing mode we want to use on canon the similar settings we have we have one shot here when nikon it's afs in canon it's a one shot continuous focusing mode so it's just opposite or we can say that it's uh, works in just opposite uh, conditions of photography compared to uh, afs AI Servo AF, we call it in a Canon and in Nikon, we call it as AFC, stands for continuous focus. So in this mode, it's uh, most useful for keeping moving subject or object look more sharp uh, within the viewfinder as you track the object. So you need to track the subject, you need to keep your focal point right on the subject. Uh, in continuous focusing mode, the camera detects the subject's movement and refocuses accordingly to keep the subject as sharp as tag. So we, we, we call most of the time in photography tag sharp images which means they are accurately sharp images but in continuous focusing it's helped you to uh, take good tag sharp images but you have to keep your uh, focal point right on the subject even if subject making movement you have to chase it you have to keep your focal point right on it because if subject miss uh, your focal point or you miss to chase that uh, frame it well on the subject then you may have focal point on the different element in the background. So what it will happen? It will take focus from the background, not from the subject. And this mode use a lot of battery power because it is continuously focusing and refocusing. It is quite similar uh, to the electronic viewfinder that any component which is keep using that uh, battery and it is going to drain the battery very soon. So the same applies here for continuous focusing. If you are in AFC, continuous focusing mode, AI servo, AF in Canon, then it's going to use the battery a lot of. So try to have your AFC mode on when it demands. When you have a subject where you're trying to track it, track your subject. You know, there are multiple ways to track your subject. You can use 3D tracking option in the uh, Nikon device, automatic uh, selection in the Canon. So all these are supportive things which are available when you are in continuous focusing mode. And you can utilize that and it will help you to track the subject. But it is going to drain the battery power. So I, my personal uh, practice is just to keep always be on the single focusing mode. And when it demands, I change to AFC as continuous focusing mode and then switch back when it works completed. That's how I just keep switching between those modes. And on the info and the camera screen, you can see here focusing modes AFC on the Nikon device on the left. On the right, we have Canon, and it's we call it as AI servo. Automatic focusing mode. So as the name suggests, automatic. This camera going to select in your focusing mode. It means if subject is making a lot of movement, camera thinks the subject is making movement. Even if you are making movement, camera take an image in AFC mode, continuous focusing mode. And if subject remains still, uh, then camera think that it's a still subject. It'll just take the photo with the AFS or single focusing mode, focusing uh, mode uh, with this image to capture. 
so you have to remember that photography can be an uh, an art and in that art you have to go with what's in your mind so sometimes with purpose we make things look out of focus to add some creative touch and in those uh, we can easily use a single focusing mode because it is not going to calculate the focus again you can make things look blurry in the background foreground you can add more creative results in your photography this mode maintains focus if you change the subject or subject moves as i said it is it uh, can, this camera going to decide uh, if subject is making movement or not so that's what that's what if you feel com- not comfortable with those modes uh, to switch between those modes so then you can have auto automatic auto focusing modes it's just for the beginners i should say manual focusing mode so this is manual focusing so it's as, as the name suggests it's a manual it means we are going to control the focusing system that it should be in the manual or in the automatic we have switches on the lens you can see af mf uh, on the device itself this is the device switch we have this is the camera switch we have so and in the camera settings we have focusing mode camera switch, uh, settings and you can select mf so it's a manual focus on the info screen we can see afa it means it's in automatic or uh, focusing mode so that's how we can identify by ways and means that which focusing mode we are using so always try to have you practice to use switches instead of going into the camera settings because uh, changing or switching between the camera settings uh, by going into the device options sometimes it takes uh, it's difficult to do it very quickly and you will miss your shot so try to use the buttons instead and you will have more frequent control on that on many lenses you have you would see af and a switch for focusing mode selection so you can see the devices you have uh, the switch on the device switch on the lens so you can use this it can be frustration so sometimes <laughs> and then uh, that's that would be the possible barrier between the good and the great photography when you want to work with the manual focusing mode so just want to give you a tip uh, that in uh, macro photography we always rely on the manual focusing it's very difficult to do micro adjustments for focusing or uh, taking focus uh, when we are in the ma- doing macro photography so ma- ma- macro photography we are in uh, everyone knows that professional they have to rely on manual focusing and that always give amazing result achieving perfect focus requires using a distance measurement on the lens barrel and even perhaps measuring the distance from the lens to the subject with a tape measures this will give you most accurate focus point so we can use depth of field calculator we can use a exposure calculator we can use measuring tape also so even the physical tape you can use to calculate the uh, distance between the lens and the subject you can calculate what will be the depth of field you will get on that distance and accurately focus you can measure on that many professional documenter uh, documentary uh, photographers they they use to use that technique manual focusing mode so just to continue this this is the manual focus when you are in manual focusing mode and uh, you you are viewing through the viewfinder you can have adapter adjustment on the nikon device it is there i'm not sure if another device we have but uh, uh, we can use this data adjustment to adjust the for we can say the viewfinder according to our eye so we don't need to wear specs we don't need to you have your glasses on while you are using the uh, your device and you can adjust the adapter and it'll adjust the uh, your device according to your eye so anything any irregularity you have in your eyes it will be adjusted for you for better focusing without using your glasses and you can use the depth of field preview button so some devices will have pv button preview button so you can see the exact kind of quality you will get after image being captured so it's a kind of electronic viewfinder uh, feature uh, that what you how the image will look like on the final capture and this is more advanced technique for photography manual focus is essential when you focus on a non traditional subject 
for example subject that is in the background when the foreground is busy and dominating so when you have a uh, you can say the con condition not favorable for photography and a lot of movement going on and you are not able to focus on the subject accurately in those uh, situations manual focus uh, is something which will always help you focus indicators so uh, when we see through the viewfinder you will see one blinky on the nikon device it is there i'm not sure if in the fuji device what does symbol or the signal we have in canon it beeps in nikon there's a blinker uh when we can see through the viewfinder that blinker keeps blink and when you have your subject right in the focus uh it'll stop blinking in the lcd view the red square will become green and in the in the canon device it also beeps that's how it uh, notify the photographer that subject is in good focus and it works even when you, we are in the manual mode manual focusing mode if you are in the manual focusing mode you have to just halfway press the shutter release button and keep adjust the uh, uh, focus on the subject keep your focal point right on the subject and once it is in good focus it will give you a signal that right, the subject is in focus and you are in the manual focusing mode that's how we can adjust it and this could help you to get the subject in tack sharp when having manual focus in mode but you have to rely on the good lighting condition if light condition is so poor you can't even see the subject clearly then it will be difficult for you to adjust the focusing because the uh, camera will not be able to identify the, the subject clearly now we'll just go through the metering mode so as we as we discussed at the start of this uh, course that we are going to discuss in detail about the metering mode so metering modes are one of the most powerful and underutilized settings on your digital camera so have you have you ever used metering modes uh, with purpose have you tried to change the metering modes you can give answer in the chat Okay. Yeah, most of us, most of us, uh, not frequently. Uh, even if uh, we are, we know that what is the metric modes. Uh, many photographers not not going frequently to the metric modes and change it. But when you have understanding of it, uh, you will tend to go and change the metric modes, and we will just understand how it works and uh, the settings, how how it can help us to improve our photography. Best photographers always starts with the best original photo. So whatever the image you see on your device is your best image, and it should be the best image. Then only you can make it uh, more amazing in your post processing, and that can only happen when you get your proper exposure. And getting proper exposure depends heavily on how you control your camera metering modes. So it's uh, really we can say the most critical part in a photography to control or to have a good hands on the. metering modes so all the professional photographers they know the importance of this and they can they utilize their photography skills and to manage the metering modes in metering modes in the nikon we have matrix metering center weighted metering spot metering in canon we have evaluative metering partial metering uh, spot metering and center weighted metering there is a one additional uh, member in the canon it's a partial metering mode and it just uh, we can say one add on on the spot metering and we will understand in details too and similarly most you must have in the fuji devices like the nikon metering modes we have now we'll just understand that matrix metering evaluative metering we call it in the canon in nikon we call it as a matrix metering and this is the default metering mode the most dear, most dslr have. when you buy a dslr by default it will be in the matrix metering mode and it reads light from the full scene calculates an average exposure in those different elements so what do you see in the image the bright things the colors the elements the subject everything what we see in the frame it is going to take average calculation for the light from all the elements and based on that it will calculate that exposure how it will be it will it will tell you that the image will be under exposed or over exposed i uh, and this mode is excellent under the following circumstances so you want to work fast with minimal change in the settings 
so if we have if we are doing some event photography we 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 can't go every time in the settings and change it so we have to continually uh, do the uh, photography work without going much into the settings so this metering mode will help you in that the light condition is changing quickly so when the light condition really changing quickly like in the around the sunset or sunrise time uh, we can we can manage with that matrix metering uh, metering mode you are covering actions and angle to subject is changing again it's a uh, quite similar that when we don't have much time to adjust the settings we can we can manage with this metering mode that's why we we have this as a default in the camera settings the lighting and contrast are not extreme so this is the uh, we can say the uh, main catching point here that that why we need to utilize other metering modes because it's only giving you good uh, results when light conditions and contrast are not extreme so when we don't have too bright too uh, we can say the dark light conditions or the contrast as the contrast also not extreme then we can manage with this matrix metering mode This is the example photo I captured in the matrix metering mode. In some cameras, extra weight is given to the point that is near to the focus point that is being used. So where you have your focal point uh, from and where you keep your focal point on the subject, on the element, most of the weightage will be given to that focal point. And it's taking most of the calculation from that focal point around the area of that. And overall, it's taking the whole frame uh, for the image, for the light calculation, average calculation for the light. Center weighted metering. This mode determines the correct exposure uh, from about 60 to 80 percent of actual frame and focusing on the center. So when we talk, when, as the name suggests, center weighted metering, it means we are giving all the weightage or the preference to the center of that, and uh, we want our subject right in the center. Most of the portrait photographers. They have, your, they have their subject right in the middle and they use center with a metering. And so it is going to take most of the exposure from the face of the portrait, uh, the subject right in the middle of the frame. The mode operates under the assumption that you will most likely center your subject in the viewfinder. So that's what it explained. When you, uh, when you would choose the center with a metering mode, it's perfect for even situations like a wedding most of the wedding photographer they love to use or they rely mostly heavily on the center weighted metering because not a lot of background lightings were there and will be there uh, in the event and it is not going to take most of the calculation from the background lighting to just try to take a calculation for the light from the subject you don't want the background to influence your metering rate, as I explained. You try, you're trying to meter a light from the object against a dark background or vice versa. You want to keep your subject in center within the frame, such as water. So as we have explained and discussed, we want to our subject right in the middle. This is the example photo I captured with the center weighted metering. It was uh, quite a cloudy day. And I don't want to have compensate on the exposure. I use this and kept my focus right on the board, and it's where it works very well. Most useful in event photography, where the use of spot metering mode is not practical. So, where you see the spot metering is not workable, not work, not giving you the or not possible to have spot metering. Better to work with the center weighted metering. Now we'll just understand in detail for spot metering mode. Spot metering mode, as the name suggests, it's a spot and where you have your focal point, it'll take most of the calculation, 1% to 5%, all the calculation for average light, it is going to take from the spot. So if you have your subject in the darkness, sometimes something are very low light is there and we can see very little of your the light falling on the subject, try to take all the image calculation, the light calculation using the metering mode, spot one. Spot metering mode will help you to give better results in that. And it usually represents by a small red dot and fixed directly in the center when you see through the viewfinder. 
you would use it uh, by pointing it at the subject element that you want to take the meter reading from so we will directly point it we will fill the frame we'll zoom in we'll fill the frame we'll take the focus uh, or the metering mode focal uh, focal calculation the spot metering metering mode calculation all this we are going to take from the subject spot metering mode is extremely useful it allows you to exactly fine tune your exposure so this is the hardest but it's extremely useful to use it uh, if you are able to use it the camera won't be fooled by an extreme contrast situation which has backlighting so we have utilized the center weighted metric but we can use with the spot metering mode also but again it's very difficult to keep your spot uh, your spot right on the subject and even it's very difficult to control that's why we uh, move shift to the center weighted metering you can get an accurate metering mode metering meter reading from an object where you have set the focal point so it's taking accurate reading from that spot it will allow you to accurately de determine an exposure setting for a bright object against a dark background you can test it at your home you can do a test photography where you can keep your some bright subject in front of dark background or in you know, some dark subject in front of white background and you can see the results uh, how it how it will give you a result with the spot metering and the matrix matrix metering mode you will see the quality the result and you will be amazed by seeing that this is the example i photo i captured this photo with spot metering mode because the background was very bright and i tried if i if i would have tried with the matrix metering mode i it would have been quite dull on the subject make sure always check your camera setting mode before shooting to ensure you are getting correct exposure so that's what uh, we should do whenever we are taking photo if we see that uh, it's not exposure is not quite good and the, there is nothing much wrong with those camera settings then we should work on the metering mode then you will see the amazing result after that partial metering mode it's just additional we can say the advantage with the canon users they have it's a works like say works like a spot metering mode only but it will give you some added uh, area of that coverage uh, it'll instead of one to five percent it'll take the calculation from 10 to 15 percent of the frame and this mode serves as a middle point between the spot metering mode and center weighted in spot metering mode it's one to five percent center weighted 60 to 80 percent and in between 10 to five percent it is partial metering mode similar to spot metering it is useful when some areas of the scene would affect the overall exposure and making it too dark or light it has few benefits it creates a, a tight accurate reading from approximately 20 percent of the image area works like a spot metering mode but takes into account a larger area the metering area is often adjustable allowing you to move it around the viewfinder use center weighted metering mode instead of partial metering mode when and that is not available in your camera so if you don't have canon device you can rely on center weighted metering now we'll just go through a few composition techniques because uh, camera settings uh, having control in the camera settings is one thing and creating your compositions framing your subject is totally different story and that's where your photography journey begins that you under you have understanding of compositions so we have uh, five composition techniques here and you will definitely take advantage of it rule of thirds is the th is a, we can say the first and foremost the, the starting uh, composition technique even the uh, dslr device they have their grid view uh, on the lcd where we can see that uh, two horizontal two vertical lines dividing the image into nine equal parts and these intersection points are the we can say the interesting points in our frame where we can place over subject and you can do this right on their lcd by enabling that grid view this is one of the most talked about composition techniques perhaps because it is so simple to implement but also because of what it suggests it's a rule of thumb all you need to do is divide your frame vertically into three equal parts and uh, 
horizontally into three equal, equal parts. You can see this image divided vertically and horizontally into three equal parts. By placing your subject one of the four points where these dividing line will. So these intersection points where the lines crossing each other, these are we call as a focal points or we can say the most interesting points we should have over uh, frame there. You will encourage the viewer away from the center of the frame. So scientifically, if we are viewing any image, we are uh, seeing any image, we don't see right in the center. We start seeing through these uh, intersection points or on the corners, we start reading the image. And that's the basics of this uh, rule of third. This forces them to look around the image and makes your composition more interesting. We'll see a few examples of rule of thirds here. This is one of the food photography example. You can see the elements and subject and advertising style photography I've done here. And I use the rule of third most of the time in my photography. And I feel it more comfortable with that. And you can see how the focal points are helping me to make this uh, frame. Again, it's a full of action photography. Where I have subject, object, and it's very complex visual if you see the background. But still, because uh, I'm following some composition technique here, I'm able to create some balance in the composition. So all the interesting elements I try to cover in the focal points, even the background. Isolate the subject. So this is a quite interesting composition technique we have different ways of implementing it either we can have over zoom lens directly zoom into the subject to isolate any distraction from behind uh, of the subject or we can use a shallow depth of field we can have a good as uh, small number of aperture we can use use that to blur out all the distraction in the background we can use uh, light conditions in our favor where the shadows are also create, being created and we can use the shadows to hide any distractions around the subject. All these techniques we can use. And this is what explain on this uh, content what we have on the slide. The image example, you can see that how I created this image uh, earlier. Uh, it was having some distraction around the subject. What I've done in the post processing, I created a vignette effect and hide all the things uh, surrounded on the cactus. Isolate the subject examples. So you can see the uh, butterfly here. I used a f5.6 on 300 mm lens, and uh, it's a zoom lens. You can see the background is completely blurred out because uh, I used 300 mm, and the tree there was tree behind the butterfly. It was quite at some distance. It was around, I believe, somewhere around 30 to 40 feet away from that butterfly. And it was good enough to give me a clean um, image of that butterfly using that technique. This is from street photography. I was on a 85 mm lens. It's the prime lens I have. And I was on 3.5. 3.5 was good enough on 85 mm to blur out the surroundings in the on, the on the street. So even in the busiest background, I have blurred uh, the background and it, it gave me the quite good interesting image. Leading lines. So one simple way of use uh, to use your lines uh, is for their drawing power. So when we have lines in our frame, it could be any line, it could be created from the uh, street lines, it could be nature, uh, when we are doing nature photography, we can use branches. So any line you have in your image, you can use in your favor and then you can create your composition. Uh, we call it as a leading line. So we have lines where it's leading to a spot. Sometimes we call it as a spot and line also. And uh, the composition techniques. Uh, so all these techniques we can use uh, in our favor. So if you see this image, uh, I have some lines around the buildings and it's reaching on the top and there is one bird, if you can notice, on the top. 
I was fortunate where by the time I take a, took a shot, the bird came. Instead of a plane, I, I found a bird and I found this image very interesting to me. These are the examples of leading lines. If we have diagonal lines, vertical lines in the same frame that considered more appealing, more interesting. When we have diagonal lines in our frame, they add more energy. And when we have horizontal, vertical lines in our frame, they create kind of static energy or the feel in the frame. That's how the, the line position can create different effect. zigzag line so this is also considered as a leading line in nature we can easily find it you can see one diagonal diagonal line also incorporated in the same one so if we have multiple type of lines in the same frame that considered also good repetition so as the name suggests anything repetitive is showing in the frame that uh, that create more energy in the frame that create more interest in the frame so objects can be arranged and uh, repetitive patterns in our photographs um, we can use the fence poles leading lines pedestrian crossings trees we have a group of trees in the same line we can use that anything can be arranged into a repetitive pattern uh, can bring great intensity to a photograph like this uh, photo you can see here. It's a nature photo and the leaf pattern. I like that in the repetitive form. The example of it. You can see this uh, patterns of uh, the crossing lines. I've used it. I found this scene on the street photography workshop and it's really creates a kind of uh, harmony in the frame because of these patterns patterns not regular you can see that even the patterns are not regular then also still still creating harmony we don't feel any we can say the kind of uh, energy or intensity in the frame we feel very uh, cool or calm by looking at this frame even if the patterns are irregular Creating layers. So this is the final composition techniques we have in this module in this course uh, for this workshop. Creating layers. So this is one of my favorite uh, photography or composition techniques uh, for me because it helps me to create depth, create kind of cinematic view. The interesting, we can say that I can I feel more of more of a three D effect in my image. One technique for adding depth into your images is the layering things. Up, sometimes we call it as up things. Uh, they, are, they are different different names, uh, but the, the purpose or the visuality will be same. Uh, simply, we can put our subject to cover one part uh, of your frame with something closer to the camera in order to give the illusion of depth. So you can see the vase I have. I covered this. Uh, I cut. I just. I can use. I use this as my first layer. I use this guy taking photo yeah, as my second layer because that's how I travel in the image. And the background or the person you can see in the background is my third layer and there I kept the focus on this photo. I was covering one uh, local event and during that I captured this image. You can use the leaves or trees uh, to uh, to frame a couple in the park so you must have seen a lot of pre-wedding photographies where we see the photos where couple sitting in the park or somewhere where we are covering some part with the trees or branches or the leaves that's how we create that effect so this this is all the examples of what I explained here but we can create our own creative creative results anywhere in the uh, in any kind of generous photograph. Whatever photography you are doing, you can have similar results using these composition techniques. 
and all of these are not things not only fill your frame with interesting elements and they further the story you are trying to tell they can they help you to tell the story they'll help you to create good story visuals in your frame by including all these elements in one image and just for conclusion these are there are 19 more types of composition so there are 19 more so i have 24 composition techniques covered in my dedicated uh, course uh, for composition photographic composition i have a dedicated course four hours online session where we'll talk about only composition techniques and in this basic photographic workshop there is only so much whatever what i've covered this is a very huge topic i tried to cover in two hours I tried my best. Hopefully, it will. It has really helped you, and it may help you to improve your photography further. You must have some keynotes, and you can note down just to make sure you are following in your future photography. Just a brief introduction on the Stellar Photo Stellar Photo Recovery software because I'm collaborated with the Stellar, and they are having me their software which helps to recover the. Uh, deleted files, deleted deleted images on your computer. You can use that. Even the memory card, if got corrupted, uh, file got deleted, you can you can use that software, and it'll help you recover the files easily. Uh, even even if you have a large uh, storage device, you can easily recover that file if deleted or corrupted. There are options uh, to recover deleted photo, uh, so you can recover deleted photo from the recycle uh, from the files. Even if you empty your recycle bin on your computer, you can still recover that from the location where it was. And devices such as DSLR, hard drive, smartphones, SSDs, the digital camera memory cards, all these uh, storage devices, what you have, even the CD DVDs are uh, writable, of course, you can recover that supports recovery of raw file format so this is the you can see the strong point of this uh, recovery software that it helps to recover raw file formats recover from formatted memory cards even if you have hard drive or memory card formatted you can still recover the, the files from there it performs deep scan uh, to recover the, every bit of uh, which what, what has lost in the deleted and uh, deleted photos and videos which are especially helpful in cases where uh, your device is severely corrupted. You can easily recover using this uh, method, recovery from formatted drive. These are the options there. Uh, recover from bad sector. So this is technical term. So in, in just, I will try to explain you in very simple language. The bad sector is something, a part of your storage device where the data is could not be, we can say the, seen or uh, read you can't do anything with the data because it's on the bad sectors it can help you to recover the data from the bad sectors also works smoothly with high storage capacity media of up to 6 db capacity so even the higher very large capacity storage you have you can use this software to for recovery Okay, so this is the rating I have given to the software 4.5. And because uh, uh, the thing is, when we start the for recovery process, uh, you can't you can't stop it once in let's say when it is in the final stage. It'll it'll give you keep uh, prompt you. It'll it'll allow you to stop it in the middle. But when you are doing final recovery at the last phase of this recovery uh, during this. Uh, when you are running this software, it will not let you stop it. You have to let it complete. Whatever time it takes depends on the data, how much data you are recovering. So otherwise, it's a very good software. If you if you want, you can have your one month free license. You can send me email and I can help you get a one month free license from the Stellar. I have my next special photo work workshop uh, next month it's on 5th November uh, I have special photo work outdoor event and basic, basic photography the same what we are doing right now every month I'm covering this and uh, one will be the morning outdoor event and in the evening will be the uh, online session I have up upcoming outdoor workshops so I try to keep uh, continue these my outdoor, work, outdoor workshops 
uh, in Pune city, of course, uh, for nature photography, birds photography, and street photography. So I'm just exploring more locations, uh, even uh, outside Pune also. So based on that interest and the possibility, I may have my presence in other part of the uh, India. So I'm just looking out the better options. Upcoming outdoor workshop. So this again, uh, my special advanced photography workshop for light painting, I have on 8th October. Uh, there I'm just uh, explaining how we can work with long exposure and capture the light uh, with the long exposure. It's a really uh, good if you, someone wants to study more night photography and capturing lights in the night. It's really good learning in that. I have my upcoming online courses. Uh, as I said, I'm having one dedicated course for photo composition. I have street photography course. Uh, street photography course, I'm doing this online just to make sure. Uh, so all that uh, conceptual knowledge I'm sharing on this uh, on, uh, online course, because everything it's really difficult to cover on outdoor course, outdoor, outdoor events. Outdoor events are more designed for practicals. So all the conceptual knowledge, detailed the theoretical part, all we can cover in online session very easily. A Lightroom course, uh, I'm offering Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom, and Lightroom editing courses also. I'm just covering almost all concepts, all parts in that, so you will be more comfortable in post-processing using those tools. Flower photography, in the flower photography, it's a three hour workshop. I'm going to explore, explain all the photo flower photography techniques, tips and tricks, and how we can create images even with the, you can say the uh, handy camera, a very uh, you can capture the images with a very entry level camera. You can you can just work on the post processing and you will give, you can get amazing results. So it's it's a more about the post processing how we are doing on the flower photography and the composition techniques, of course, uh, how we can compose well over flowers. Okay, great. So uh, so this this session has helped you. To know more about the photography, so we can say that the theoretical part and the compositions techniques. So I'm sure it is going, it is going to help you. It's all about the practice. How you are going to use these in practice. Most welcome. If I'm able to help you, then it's a I am feeling more more happy than you because I was able to help you. Anyhow, uh, if you have any question later on also, you can send me on the email info at smithphotoworld.com. You can always send me your questions there and I will definitely try to help you in that. For more detailed knowledge on specific genres of photography, you can visit my website, you can check what are the courses available and you can enroll for same because that will be more dedicated session on particular subject and we have more detailed discussion on that part. Okay, with this note, I'm just waiting for your feedback and thank you so much again for joining today. Let's conclude this session now. Have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.